Welcome back, everybody, to the Child Repair Guide. I'm Dr. Steve Silvestro, and my guest today is Dr. Michael Daigneau, emergency medicine physician at Providence St. Joseph Medical Center in Burbank, California. Mike, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, man. Great to see you again. Yeah. So we are talking about a very hot topic right now that everyone is is thinking about and talking about. And, you know, I think, honestly, a lot of folks are really worried about. So let's start talking about what coronavirus is and, and why this is such a big deal right now. Well, I think what the concern is, I mean, obviously, we've had coronaviruses around for a while, at least in the last 40 to 50 years, um, notably the, the SARS outbreak in Asia a few years ago, and then the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome called MERS a few years ago. And this particular coronavirus is from that same family. And so we're seeing, you know, I think the, the key word is this with this is it's a rapidly evolving situation. I mean, what we're doing now compared to last month or even a couple weeks ago is is different. I mean, we really are responding to the virus. And by we, I mean, you know, local governments, state governments, countries, and then on a global level. I mean, we really don't know what we're doing with it. A, it's a novel coronavirus. And we're responding to the outbreak based on how it's spreading. I mean, initially it was just in China, and now we're seeing spread to the Middle East and Asia, and then, of course, the first couple of cases in the United States. So I think it's showing that we can respond to an evolving situation, but it's also showing how unprepared we are. Um, I think as as doctors, I mean, we're, we're seeing this at the local level, and um, I think our biggest concern is are we fully prepared for what we need to do at the local level, the local ERs, the doctor's offices, the hospitals? How so? What do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, I mean, just based on my own experience um, at Providence, St. Joe's, I mean, it's like every a couple of days we get another email. OK, these are the guidelines we're following now. And you're just watching that evolution and how things are changing. I mean, they're doing a great job of, of basically tailoring the response to what we're seeing locally and globally, like which patients we test, which patients we don't, and um, making sure that we have the right diagnostics available. Um, most of our, I mean, I think everywhere, all the testing is sent to a few central laboratories, at least in this country. So, you know, people looking for like a quick response, like go oh, go to the ER and get checked for coronavirus. Um, we're not going to get an immediate diagnostic response like we would with like a point of care testing for flu or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that we're, it's, it's, it's almost like old school science, like old school detective work. Like it's not just doing a diagnostic test. I mean, to become a person of interest, um, in the eyes of like the public health establishment, it's mostly, it's your symptoms and then it's your, it's the, your story, like where did you go recently? Like who did you come in contact with? I mean, that's more of how we're going to determine whether somebody even needs to be tested. Yeah, yeah, because initially it was all just about where you'd been, right? right? Travel, and and now that it really is here in the United States, it's where you've been and who do you know who may have had it. Mm -hmm. um, we even in our office have started now to ask folks when they come in where they've traveled. Um, and then if they have been to places where we know that there are, are cases, they're getting punted around the back and into a, a back room um, with symptoms or without, just to be on the safe side. Which on the one hand, you know, I'm people who listen to this podcast know I'm always trying to, to ease people's worries. Um, but with something like this, because we are still learning about it, like you said, it's, it's novel, it's new. We haven't really seen this one before. No one's really taking too many chances. Mm -hmm. And I think the, you know, going back to talking about it being your first question, it's a, from the same family of coronaviruses, um, like any organism on the planet, this virus's main goal is to spread. And I think in a sense, you could say that it's a smarter virus than it's MERS or SARS cousins, because it doesn't 
kill quickly and it doesn't kill everyone. I mean, SARS was able to be contained relatively quickly within a particular region because it had a higher mortality rate. It was a much more virulent virus. Um, it killed its host and those countries were able to contain it. Um, the concern that I have with this one is that the disease progress is much more indolent. It spreads slowly, like it, it gets you sick, but not sick enough. So it's allowing you, the virus is allowing you to survive and walk around and infect, I think it's an average of two to three people for every, whoever, whatever patient, for every patient that has coronavirus, I think you, you can spread it to two or three, I think that's their latest estimate. Um, and then those people are also not as sick and then they spread it. So, yeah. you know, that's the concern for me is that this, this virus appears to be smarter. And even we know now with our, with the first cases in the States, like some of these cases haven't even, they haven't even been symptomatic or they haven't even had that particular travel history, which makes it even more like, okay, now we have this community spread. How do we deal with that? Yeah. And that's one thing that has been discussed, I feel like, in, in the last several days, that there may be potentially tens of thousands yeah. more cases than we know about, which on the one hand might be a good thing, that if they're all very mild symptoms and, and people aren't dying. You know, the, the last number I saw was that it was a 2% mortality rate, which sounds, maybe you can look at it and say it's really small, but in medicine, that's that's kind of huge. Um mm -hmm. But if there are tens of thousands of people who've got just mild cases to the point that we're missing this, that mm -hmm. might put a big dent in that mortality rate and it might not be as high as we think. Is is that right? So you're saying that you don't think the if there's that many patients that are getting infected slowly and not dying, then the mortality rate is probably lower. Is that what you're, what you're saying than what we think? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. You mean if we actually knew that the numbers like an actual, like, I mean, obviously there's no way to hundred percent know the total number of people who are infected. I think it's like 87,000 globally now. And, um, initially when this was reported, I remember the first article on CNN and, uh, what China was reporting was like in the hundreds. And there was, um, a response from the Imperial college of London who do like global health tracking. And they, they're like, nah, they're, they're like, I, they're, we promise you the numbers are probably already more, already in the thousands. Oh. So it was so early on. That was like back in um, like one of the first weeks in January. So, you know, I think you're right. I think that the numbers of people infected are probably much higher than we think. Um, and like you said, is that a good thing? Probably. Um, one of my colleagues in the ER uh, who relieved me after my shift yesterday, he's been working about 30, 40 years. And he also works in urgent care. And he made, I asked him, I was like, are you seeing a lot of people come in to your urgent care saying they want to be tested? And he's like, oh, yeah. And they're saying, well, you know, what are my chances that my symptoms, okay, fever, cough, some shortness of breath are coronavirus? And so he'll check them for flu. It'll be negative. He'll do a chest x-ray. They don't have pneumonia. He said, well, you have symptoms of a viral illness. You're flu negative. You don't have pneumonia. Can I tell you that you don't have coronavirus? No. Yeah. But. His good point was, if you do have coronavirus, you're building immune, immunity to it. You're contributing thus to the herd immunity. That's not a bad thing either. Because we always have to think in terms of, you know, us as a species as a whole, like how we're going to respond to this. But I thought he made a really good point with that. Yeah. So what are symptoms that people should, I don't want to say should look for necessarily, because yeah. that makes it say like rush off to your doc as soon as you have it. Yeah. Um, but, but what what are the symptoms that people should be looking for? Well, fever. I mean, with any kind of viral illness, as you know, it's going to be, you're going to have a fever. You're going to have chills. Um, I think in this case, we're, we're more looking at lower respiratory symptoms. So mm -hmm. that would be, you know, shortness of breath. Um, they're so nonspecific. I mean, it's, and, the, and that brings up the other point, how challenging this is in the middle of, a flu season yeah um totally that right. yeah i mean i don't know what your experience has been on the east coast i mean but i say relative to previous years it's been not as bad um we saw a lot of flu a initially and then it became you know flu b but um yeah so going back to your question so some fever some shortness of breath um very non-specific symptoms body aches 
Um, and then you, you're, the older patients would be the ones I would be worried about. I mean, their symptoms are even less helpful. So they would be like weak, generalized weakness, poor appetite, nausea, um, low energy, things like that. I mean, they might not even have a fever or chills. I mean, that's what gets us concerned. Um, yeah, and it would, and then the secondary thing like we talked about, like, what is your, what's your travel history? Like, who did you come in contact with? Like, what have you been doing? Those are all very important questions too. And um, so it's, I think that is going to be the challenge, right? Like, what do you tell people to look for? There's no, there's no magic bullet symptom. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, we were talking before we started recording about the flu and how more often than not, it's not necessarily the flu itself that is is lethal. In some cases it is, but right. for a lot of people, it's a secondary pneumonia or someone's sure. prone to wheezing. It could be the flu directly. Right. What is it with coronavirus or this strain of coronavirus that, for what we know right now, may have 2% or something like that uh, of people have a mm -hmm. really poor outcome? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, most of the mortality has been in um, patients, I think, 60 or older, and then it increases exponentially at age, you know, just the decade of 60 and then 70 and then definitely after 80. Um, I think, you know, those patients are already chronically sick. They have diabetes. They have uh, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, all those other comorbidities. Um, and I was saying to some people the other day, I mean, the most important thing you can do to protect yourself against coronavirus is to get the flu shot and the pneumonia vaccine. Not mm -hmm. because those things protect you against coronavirus, but like you said, they protect you against, you know, the secondary causes. So say you have pneumonia, you're going to be more susceptible to coronavirus, and then you can develop more of a, a bad course because you're infected with the two of them. Um, yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so like what you were saying, any any kind of virus can give you a uh, like a viral pneumonia, like a shortness of breath, a hypox hypoxia, like decreased amount of oxygen. Um, all the all the, the concerning things that we look for as risk factors for complications or serious illness from coronavirus. Yeah, oh. yeah. And and from what I've seen, where it stands right now, it seems that at least a lot of those folks listening to this podcast. Uh, mm -hmm with their kids you know kids are not seeming to have as bad of an outcome with this mm -hmm. is that right like like very few kids of those who've been hospitalized have actually been children yeah that's that's an interesting from interesting point that you bring up from like an epidemiology point of view like why aren't we seeing children affected by this or i mean it seems like if the if the media is reporting all these cases in europe especially now that they would say they usually make a point like oh a lot of them a lot of them are kids or not and they seem to be like predominantly adults i haven't heard about any kids infected and never never mind any children like actually dying from coronavirus yet yeah. so um yeah so what does that mean i don't know i guess is a short answer like how come it's not affecting kids um <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. But. Yeah, me neither. And they may be getting sick, but just maybe not as sick. Yep. I mean, that those might, and it, as, as you certainly see, um, kids with cold symptoms, you know, especially during the winter months, um, most of the time it's coronavirus too, right? Like the traditional coronavirus that we know about, not, not this one, obviously, but um, the, the RSV and the other stuff like that. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, but, you know, again, I don't think we, as I said before, it's such an evolving situation. We can't say the kids are not going to get it, or whatever. I mean, you still have to, for all the parents listening, I mean, you still have to make sure your kids are doing the traditional things like washing their hands, keeping their hands away from their face. I mean, it's not very like sexy recommendations, but I mean, it's back to basics, yeah, you know, yeah. wash your hands for however long it takes to sing happy birthday twice is what I usually yep. tell kids and adults. And if you actually do it, you realize it's a long time to wash your hands. And then you realize how you don't usually do that in general, unfortunately. People just kind of give it a quick rinse and that's it and how that doesn't do anything. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know if, if uh, you've had this done recently, but I remember when I was a resident, every couple of months, one of the nurses, like the charge nurse would come on the floor and say, mm -hmm. all right, 
she squirts something onto our hands. We have to rub it all over the place and then wash our hands and then go into a dark room and she'd have a UV light and you'd see all the stuff that you didn't wash off. And, yeah. you know, we were people who were trained to wash our hands well <laughs> and do it all day yeah. long. And there's still a little bit of something that you miss. Yeah. I need to make a video about how to teach kids to wash hands well. Yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a, a fun way to do it. And, and I think that, I mean, if they can impress one new thing upon them is just to make sure they get the back of their hands. I think that's one area mm. people can really miss. It's always about the front and they don't remember to turn over to the backside. But um, and yeah, so I think we could probably all do that better. So I want to talk about what families can do to prepare and, and you know, what should be going on there. But right before we do, what has been the course of this? I mean, I, I'm sure that most people listening have probably followed at least some of this story as it's gone on. But what have we seen? You know, it started off in China and I know that Italy and Iran are big hotspots right now. What has the, the course and the spread of this looked like? Well, I think we're seeing like uh, obviously the initial China outbreak where, you know, you still have 80, I think 80,000 of the 87 total thousand cases are there. And then, you know, this day and age travel by plane is just so much more accessible and easy for everyone. And um, like we talked about before, how how easily this virus can spread from person to person without making them super sick very early on. So now what we're seeing is sort of these regional outbreaks. You're having a regional outbreak in Europe, and the epicenter seems to be Italy, mostly Milan. And then you're seeing a regional outbreak in the Middle East um, with the center uh, in Iran. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're hearing about every – now every – every, um, most of the countries in Europe now all have these individual small cases, but not real outbreaks on their own. And um, the same with Iran. Um, but then, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of wonder uh, if we're if we're seeing some underreporting from the Middle East, especially Iran, especially yeah, because yeah. Iran's initial um, claim to how many cases they have and then how quickly that changed over the next couple of days. So, um, well, they also had the case of the the health minister who was yeah. <laughs> sweating on TV, saying, "Hey, it's not that bad. We have it contained." And the next yeah. day, it was reported that he had it too. Yeah. Yeah. saying, uh, I have Corona, I have Corona, yeah. <laughs> um, so that makes me a little concerned. Um, you know, and the same thing happened in China, like the initial claim to how many they ca cases they have, and when people started to pay more attention, and that it was a much broader outbreak than we saw. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, then looking at the United States, like what kind of, what can we expect here? Again, it's really hard to say. I mean, we've had a couple. We've had what seems like a small outbreak in Oregon right now, and um, then today there was another case in Rhode Island. Yep. Um, and we've had a couple. The cases that we've had here in California were people with very specific travel history to China, um, Oregon. I'm not sure. And then there was, a, I think, there was a couple in Chicago as well. So right now, I think the the way it looks in the states is we're seeing like maybe a bit of a community spread. Um, it's, it doesn't look as bad as it did in Europe, but I mean, it's, it's just so hard to predict what course this is going to take. I mean, this is such an evolving situation. We could have this conversation next week and it could be completely different. That's right. So by next week we could be saying, all right, now we're looking at local outbreaks on the East coast and the West coast. But, um, I think, Going back to your your initial question, I mean, I just read today that I, th I think it was Delta suspended flights from uh, New York and Miami to Milan, hmm. and that's I think another airline had already did that too. So now we're starting to see, and that wasn't because date well, their claim was there just wasn't as much of a demand for people to fly, um, but that will control the outbreak in a sense. I mean, if you if you stop plane travel, well, yeah, sure, like that's definitely going to keep it keep the outbreak regionalized. Um, so whether that was a, a, a fear response in their part or a response to the economics, like either way, I think it has the, the same result. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just kind of keeps the outbreak in those particular countries. But it's just such an evolving situation, man. It's hard to predict. Yeah, well, that's, that's, I'm going to throw a hard question to you that you might <laughs> not be able to answer because of that. But 
what 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 do you see as the sort of the worst case scenario versus the the more likely scenario you know mm-hmm. I, we were chatting before that there's a, a harvard epidemiologist yeah uh, mark lipsitch who was speaking with the atlantic if i'm mm-hmm. getting it correct uh, and he said by the end of the year or over the next year 40 to 70 percent of the world population may have been infected by this as as sort of a worst case scenario in his mind i mean from an epidemiology point of view and they're, when they're counting numbers of actual infected yeah it does sound like a worst case scenario but i mean worst case scenario for me would be you know a, a lot of people infected and a lot of people dying i mean i yeah. think you have to look at the virulence the mortality rate of this thing i mean i think for the most part you know, we may just be looking at a uh, the widespread prevalence of another virus that causes symptoms like the common cold. Um, I think that's best case scenario. Best, actually, best case scenario is <laughs> best case scenario is we're already seeing the tail end of this. Yeah. Uh, that we've got it contained in China. Um, Europe's doing a good job of controlling it and then we're pretty aggressive here to respond to all cases and then track potential exposure and um, you know home quarantine those that are generally healthy and treat those that are sick in the hospital Um, and you know travel has been limited already Um, but yeah worst case scenario is tough Um, is it a bad thing that everybody gets infected with this and has just mild symptoms and then builds an immunity to it. I mean, we might be looking at something similar to flu where every year we have to predict, okay, like based on the, like for us in the United States, our experience is also always based on what happens in Australia because they have their winter before us and the, you know, the scientists do their best, they do their best work and take their best guess as far as like, which uh, strains are going to be most likely, and then that is our flu vaccine for the year. And sometimes they hit it right, sometimes they don't, sometimes it's a mixed bag. So we might be looking at something like that, where every year we have to prepare prepare for the annual coronavirus season. And (laughs) unfortunately, it may happen around the time as flu, too. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess worst case scenario would be if this thing starts to show a high mortality rate and then the best case is that we're already seeing the tail end of it yeah yeah and what what's you- hard is right because it's like you said it's novel we haven't seen this before which also means we don't have great immunity against it and so even if we just get a large number of people who get sick mm-hmm. even if there's a low percentage mortality rate mm-hmm. when you increase the numbers of people who get sick it's still going to potentially amount to a lot of people that that pass yes yeah Yeah. and uh strain the uh the public health system and the hospitals and everything else for sure so we're recording on march 1st and and last week the cdc released a statement saying that it's basically inevitable that we're going to at least have community outbreaks here in the u.s which you know we're we're seeing potentially the seeds of that right now like you said Mm -hmm. um and I know that people have been asking me about how should they prepare. A friend of mine posted a picture of Target yesterday where it looked like a Soviet grocery store, <laughs> you know, 1980s, uh-huh. bare shelves. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's probably worthwhile to tell folks to prepare in some way. Um, but what should people be doing? You know, we've got, you know, a lot of northern Italy is, is quarantined off entirely from everybody else. Yeah. Um, hopefully we're not going to get anything close to that here. But w- what do you think people should do to, to sort of prep for themselves and their families? Yeah, I mean, going on what the CDC said and then, I mean, the federal government, too, uh, they were saying that we need to prepare for, I think the word was major disruptions <clears throat> in our life. Um, I mean, I think... Well, in California, you know, we're always dealing with this ever-present earthquake issue. Mm. So, um, you know, I always tell people to make sure they are always prepared. I mean, I still think that is still far more likely than to, to than we're going to have to deal with, like, major disruptions in our life from virus um, and to have enough water, to have enough food available. I mean, I think most people in California are used to that. But 
I, I would say that the, the hoarding that's going on with like water and food, I mean, is, is a little bit unnecessary and, um, extreme. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, I mean, going, going back to people's basic nature, just to protect themselves and protect their families. I mean, you know, it's something like this. You have to think of, try to try to think of your community, the local level, your state level nationwide. And, you know, as a population as a whole and not be overly selfish. Yeah. Um, obviously there's, it's always good to want to protect your family, protect yourself. Um, but know what you're doing, know that you're protecting yourself based on certain things like science, for example. Um, people want like a magic bullet, you know, like we were talking about before, anytime people come to see you or they come to the ER, they want like a magic treatment or they want like, you know, specific things they can do to keep themselves safe. And we know that nothing is a hundred percent safe. Right. So, I mean, I think, you know, just having enough water, like having, you know, some canned food available, but I wouldn't go to extremes. I mean, I think going back to the science, we know that if a lot of people get infected, they're not going to be super sick. They're going to carry on like they have a cold. Just, I don't think that's going to lead necessarily to significant disruptions in like our way of life, for example. So, I mean, I, I'll tell you what I've done. I mean, I haven't gone out and bought a bunch of bottled water or food or anything. I mean, I have my basic supplies that I have for an earthquake, but I haven't done anything out of the normal. Yeah. Um, what I've told a lot of folks here right in dc area we get sometimes we get snow sometimes we don't when it does snow even just a half inch everything shuts down because yep. i don't know why you think that we get snow most years we could handle it but we can't so yep. i've told families whatever you would have on hand for like three days at home with the road shut down with snow and maybe no power you know something you probably should have on hand anyhow like, like you're saying in california yeah. with earthquake earthquake supplies yeah yeah. That's a good rule of thumb. Three days, I think is fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead. What, was, what I've also sort of said to some folks to the ideally we're going to see some sort of ramp up too, right? It's not going to be that all of a sudden Philadelphia, Chicago, and DC are cut off from the rest of the country under quarantine right. out of nowhere in a matter of like two or three days. Right. I, I think that we're going to have some, if we even got to that worst case scenario, we're going to have a ramp up of a week or a couple of weeks where it's looking like the numbers are increasing and, and hopefully folks have more time to prepare more significantly if, if you need to. Sure. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I think here at least with, you know, an open society with, with free press and, you know, the, they, they've been generally, the local governments have been generally good about giving us the numbers and letting us know when people are infected. And certainly the media is on this because it's such yeah. a great story for them to follow um, that we're not all of a sudden going to be surprised with, you know, you wake up and, you know, 2,000 new cases in L.A. I mean, that you, you would expect to see in, in other countries that don't have as much of a free society like China and Iran and stuff like that. Or all of a sudden you're going to be told everything's fine and then the next day, uh, actually just kidding, you know, 5,000 people are infected. But you're 100% right. There'll be more of a ramp up, if anything, yeah. instead of just like, all right, grocery stores closed. Yikes. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, one thing that is on everyone's mind about, about preparation is, is masks. Sure. Um, you know, I, I will ask you, what is your take on masks? Uh, you know, well, I know folks probably at this point have heard about N95s and uh, what's the story there? Yeah, so masks. I mean, it's definitely the, the number one thing. And I think any time, any time lately I've done like a like a local TV shot um, and even uh, reiterated that the surgical masks don't protect you um, inevitably you'll see the reporter or the anchor put a mask on in the story. And it's just, it just, it's one of those things that looks like you're doing something and it feels like you're protecting yourself. But you know, the fact of the matter is those surgical masks do not protect you from getting infected from coronavirus or flu or any other cold virus. I mean, they're just not, they're just not thick enough. Um, but you know, when people come to the ER, whether it was coronavirus time or even before that, and they have symptoms like that, we put the, we put a mask on them 
to prevent them from spreading whatever they have in the yeah. waiting room or to, you know, your doctor, your nurse while you're in the ER. So certainly, like, if you feel sick, you should stay at home. And if you have to go out, you should wear a mask. Um, those are the surgical masks. The N95 masks, the, they're blue. Um, you know, those are what we use in the hospital. Um, and when a patient comes in with suspected coronavirus and they're put in a negative isolation room and we go in there to talk to them and examine them, like those are the masks that, that we wear to protect ourselves from getting sick because God forbid this turns into, um, you know, more of a widespread epidemic. I mean, all these people are going to end up in the ER and the hospitals and like, you know, your healthcare providers are the ones that need to be at work and to be taking care of patients. Like we need those masks. So, um, that's, that's where they belong at this point. And one thing with the, the N95 yeah. is that yeah. technically, right. It's, it's a one use and done. Yeah. And it's got to be <laughs> fitted the right way. Mm -hmm. um, I know the CDC put out a kind of a funny but true infographic a week or so ago about facial hair. Mm -hmm. And they had like 20 or 30 different styles of facial hair. And only two or three were acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, because all the rest are going to interrupt how tightly that mask can, can fit. So mm -hmm. there's also always a chance that someone buys that mask and it doesn't help anyway because it's just not used the right way. And, you know, we're technically officially trained. Right. And how to put these on. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. Yeah. I mean, every time you go to work at a new hospital and you have to get fitted and tested for the N95 mask and you have to do all those tests with it and even, yeah, with any kind of facial hair, like it could interrupt it. And I mean, even us as professional healthcare providers don't wear it correctly. So yeah, you make a very good point. Yeah. And uh, so what's the point of, you know, you're, you're getting this mask that should be reserved for the healthcare providers anyway, and you're not wearing it right when you're out there and you're just uncomfortable. So um, I, I tell, I think, you know, a good rule of thumb, again, going back to specifically to your family, to your listeners, you know, families that have kids and stuff is I think we have to start teaching our kids, you know, to be mindful of their surroundings and, um, you know, whether you're in a public place, you're on a bus, you're on a train, if someone's coughing, they're sick, move away from them. Hmm. Like keep at least four to six feet away. Six feet would even be better. I mean, you're not being rude. I think you're just protecting yourself and you're um, you're you're doing your best to protect the herd immunity as well. Like you don't want to get sick um, and you don't want your own family members to get sick. So just be mindful of your surroundings when you're walking outside. Like, and being in public, going to the supermarket, like stay off, don't be looking at your phone, don't be distracted, especially in these times, like just pay attention to what you're doing and where you're going and who's around you. Yeah. And there's also, there's, there's debate right now about disinfectant wipes and, mm, sure. uh, and other sorts of disinfectants, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, I, we were talking earlier, uh, the Lysol Clorox wipes, I think on the bottle actually specifies that it'll, it, It'll clean against 99.9% uh, .9 of most viruses, including flu. And I think they do mention coronavirus, but they're not referring to this coronavirus. I mean, these labels were printed however many years ago. Um, and so people are wondering, does this protect against the, the novel coronavirus that we're seeing right now? And the, the point of the article was, we're not sure. Mm. Maybe. Because again, it's new. We don't know. This is something that's still being studied actively in the labs. And so... Um, what, what would you recommend to people? I mean, again, like it, it can't hurt to use those wipes, but does it a hundred percent protect you? Probably not. I still think the best thing to do is just wash your hands for however long as you're supposed to. Yeah. 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 It's a tough call. Yeah. You know, speaking of how we're, everything's evolving, you know, we're learning more and experimenting more and figuring things out with this. Um, what do you know about any, any progress on, on treatments, you know, there, there's all this talk about vaccination, mm. um, which I imagine would take a, a long time to really get sorted out. Yeah, I think when you look at potential treatments, the way the the pipeline for, you know, drugs and R&D and all that stuff works, I mean, as you know, you know, creating a new drug and bringing it through the pipeline to where it's, you know, deemed safe and effective in humans takes a long time. So I think what we're seeing right now is um, 
pharmaceutical companies are looking at what they already have, what they're already using for other diseases and looking for like a secondary use and testing it to see, hey, would this antiviral that we already have be effective against coronavirus? I mean, obviously they have a huge financial uh, incentive to to do that. Um, so, I mean, there are some um, antiretroviral drugs that have been used to, to treat HIV that are being tested right now to see if they have any efficacy against this coronavirus. As far as a new compound, I mean, we're definitely looking at I would say a year. There's, an, I would be shocked if we had like something like Tamiflu available for coronavirus within a year. Yeah. And that goes the same for a vaccine. I mean, vaccine probably more likely than an actual treatment. Um, but again, like the, the the if there's a vaccine available for coronavirus, it's going to go to the hospitals and the healthcare providers first before the general public anyway. So um, I think they're I think in some countries they're already testing it. I mean, China obviously has most of the um, they've already started like DNA sequencing and stuff like that. I mean, they're doing most of the research into to seeing what would work, what kind of compounds would work. But um, we're still a bit of time away from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I had read was that, you know, the, the few articles that have said that there, there are tests on vaccines already were really just that, okay, we've got the genomic sequence of this thing. You know, China did a great job sure. of pumping that out really quickly. Yeah. Um, as opposed to say, oh, there's actually a vaccine that's being tested. It's like, no, we're kind of working yeah. on, on step one right now. Right. But we have step one. So. Yeah, we're still a little bit of ways away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't count on that. That's for sure. Right what now. what resources would you recommend for people to, to stay up to date on this and, and learn more? As it well, I think, you know, you made a point earlier about how everybody gets their news very, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Like, a, not, I don't want to say quick fix, but just, you know, when they're glancing at their phones. I mean, I'll tell you what I do. I mean, I follow WHO and I follow CDC and then I follow my local news. Like I follow L.A. Times, um, the L.A. Department of Health, because um, I think they're doing a pretty good job at uh, coming up with almost daily graphics mm. and they're evolving their message too. And, you know, it'll say, okay, this is what's recommended. This is what's not, this is what's going on. And I think, you know, this day and age, I mean, I, you know, most of, most people are getting their news from their phones and their Instagram, uh, feeds and stuff like that. And so, um, the, you know, the public health authorities are doing a good job of tailoring to that attention span. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's still your best bet. And obviously the nightly news as well, I think does a pretty good job, but, um, just like I said, you know, the, we're, we're way past the time where people would get their, get their information from sitting down together and watching the nightly news. I mean, this thing is such rapidly, so quickly, rapidly evolving. I mean, it's hour by hour. And, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, Instagram and following CDC WHO is probably your best bet at this time. Um, yeah. How can people find you and reach out to you? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm on Instagram. It's uh, Dr. Daniel, doctor, and then D-A-I-G-N-A-U-L-T. I mean, people can always uh, send me a direct message if they have any specific questions. If they want additional resources. I'm always happy to help. Yeah. I'll have that linked up in the show notes for the podcast. And oh. if we get this video out in the, the description for the video too. So, Great, man. Um, yeah, man. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Daniel. This is this has been awesome. This is definitely, like you said, a situation that is evolving, and and we're gonna get as much information as we can and and get it out to people. Yeah, let's chat again. Yeah, absolutely.